Today we are not co uh, continue of, on the Apostles' Creed. Okay, today says, "I believe in the Holy Spirit." Huh? Let me start with this song first.
a song was by Graham Kendrick, one of uh, uh, famous Christian songwriters. Okay, today we are doing, uh, we believe in the Holy Spirit, uh, the whole area in the Apostles' Creed, the thought of the Holy Spirit. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll put together a few uh, videos to help us and uh, to set the understanding first and see where we go from there. Okay, this is taken from different sources. If you've ever heard the phrase, the Holy Spirit, and you want to know what it means, where do you start? Well, you have to start on page one of the Bible, where the uncreated world is depicted as this dark, chaotic place. But then above the chaos, God's Spirit is there, hovering, ready to bring about life and order and beauty. Okay, but... What is God's Spirit? Yeah, so the Spirit is the way the biblical authors talk about God's personal presence. The Hebrew word is ruach. Ruach. Yeah, you got to clear your throat at the end. So what is it? Well, ruach can refer to a number of different things, but what they all have in common is energy. Energy? How so? So there's an invisible energy that makes the clouds move or the tree branches sway. Right. Wind. So in Hebrew, that's ruach. Okay. Now take a big breath. <sighs> So you feel that inside you? Yeah, the air? Well, specifically the energy, right? The vitality in your body that you get from breathing deeply, that too is ruach. And this is the same word used in the Bible to describe God's personal presence. Just like wind and breath are invisible, God's spirit is invisible. Wind is powerful, and so God's spirit is powerful. And just as breath keeps us alive, so God's spirit sustains all of life. Yeah, ruach. Now, as we continue on in the story of the Bible, we see God's Ruach giving special empowerment to people for specific tasks. The first person in the Bible this happens to is Joseph. God's Spirit enables him to understand and interpret dreams. And then it happens to this guy named Bezalel, and he's an artist. God's Spirit empowers him with wisdom and skills. He's given creative genius to make beautiful things in the tabernacle. And we also see God's Ruach empower a group of people called the prophets. They're able to see what's happening happening in history from God's point of view. That's exactly right. And here's the problem as the prophet saw it. While God's Ruach had created a really good world, humans have given in to evil. They've unleashed chaos into it through their injustice. A new type of disorder. Yes. And the prophet said the spirit would come, just like in Genesis 1, but now to transform the human heart, to empower people to truly love God and others. How will this new act of God's spirit happen? Well, centuries pass and we are introduced to Jesus. And at the beginning of his mission, there's this beautiful scene where Jesus is being baptized in the waters of the Jordan River. Yeah, the sky opens up and God's spirit comes and rests on him like a bird. The story is saying that God's spirit is empowering Jesus to begin the new creation. And we see this happening when he heals people or forgives their sins. He's creating life where there once was death. Now, Israel's religious leaders oppose Jesus and they eventually have him killed. But even here, God's spirit is at work. The earliest disciples of Jesus, who saw him alive from the dead, said it was God's energizing spirit that raised Jesus. This is the beginning of new creation. Yes, and it's still going. When Jesus appeared to his closest followers, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. And soon after that, the Spirit powerfully comes on all of his disciples. So that they can become a part of this new creation and share the good news and learn how to live by the energy and influence of God's Spirit. And so today, the Spirit is still hovering in dark places. Yes, pointing people to Jesus, transforming and empowering them so they can love God and others. And the Christian hope is that the Spirit is going to finish the job. The story of the Bible ends with a vision of a new humanity, living in a new world that's permeated with God's love and life-giving spirit. What is the role of the Holy Spirit in our lives today? We're going to answer that question. Of all the gifts given to mankind by God, there is none greater than the presence of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit has many functions, roles, and activities. First, He does a work in the hearts of all people everywhere. Jesus told the disciples that He would send the Spirit into the world to convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. Everyone has a God consciousness, whether they admit it or not. The Spirit applies the truths of God to the minds of men to convince them 
that they are sinners, responding to that conviction brings men to salvation. Once we are saved and belong to God, the Spirit takes up residence in our hearts forever, sealing us with the confirming, certifying, and assuring pledge of our eternal state as His children. Jesus said that He would send the Spirit to be our helper, comforter, and guide. And I will ask the Father, and He will give you another counselor to be with you forever. The Greek word translated as counselor means one who is called alongside and has the idea of someone who encourages and exhorts. The Holy Spirit takes up permanent residence in the hearts of believers. Jesus gave the Spirit as a compensation for His absence to perform the functions toward us which He would have done if He had remained personally with us. Among those functions is the revealing of truth. The Spirit's presence within us enables us to understand and interpret God's Word. Jesus told His disciples that when He, the Spirit of truth, comes, He will guide you into all truth. He reveals to our minds the whole counsel of God as it relates to worship, doctrine, and Christian living. He is the ultimate guide, going before, leading the way, removing obstructions, opening the understanding, and making all things plain and clear. He leads in the way we should go in all spiritual things. Without such a guide, we would be apt to fall into error. A crucial part of the truth He reveals is that Jesus is who He said He is. The Spirit convinces us of Christ's deity and incarnation, his being the Messiah, his suffering and death, his resurrection and ascension, his exaltation at the right hand of God, and his role as the judge of all. He gives glory to Christ in all things. Another one of the Holy Spirit's roles is being a gift giver. 1 Corinthians 12 describes the spiritual gifts given to believers in order that we may function as the body of Christ on earth. All these gifts are given by the Spirit so that we may be His ambassadors to the world, showing His grace and glorifying Him. The Spirit also functions as a fruit producer in our lives. When He indwells us, He begins the work of harvesting His fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. These are not works of our flesh, which is incapable of producing such fruit, but they are the products of the Spirit's presence in our lives. The knowledge that the Holy Spirit of God has taken up residence in our lives, that He performs all these miraculous functions, that He dwells with us forever, and that He will never leave or forsake us is cause for great joy and comfort. Thank God for this precious gift, the Holy Spirit, and His work in our lives. That answers the question, what is the role of the Holy Spirit in our lives today? Grieving and quenching the Holy Spirit are both sins, of course, against the Holy Spirit. And two different Greek words are used for grieve and quench. Uh, when a person grieves the Holy Spirit, they literally cause the Holy Spirit pain. Uh, when we read, for instance, in Hebrews chapter 12, discipline yourself, rather, all discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but painful. Now, we translate that in many of the English translations as sorrowful, but the Greek word is the same. All discipline for the moment is not joyful but painful. So when we see Paul writing and commanding, do not grieve the Holy Spirit, he really means that we can cause him pain. And the only reason we can cause him pain is because he's a person. Only persons can experience pain. We grieve him when we sin against Him in any way. Then to quench the Holy Spirit is a totally different word, and it has both a literal meaning and a figurative meaning. The literal meaning is to put out a fire. It would be like taking a bucket of water and dousing a real fire and seeing the smoldering ashes underneath the weight of the water. The literal meaning is that, but the figurative meaning is to stifle. And that's the word that Paul brings into the literature to say, do not stifle the work of the Holy Spirit. So, though there are many ramifications, just one for now, and that is, I stifle the Holy Spirit when He's leading me, prompting me, convicting me, 
and I respond back to him and simply say, I will not know. And then I've quenched him. Have you ever wondered if you committed the unforgivable sin? When I was younger, I remember reading Mark 3.29, which says, But whoever blasphemes the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. After reading that, I was truly scared that I might have blasphemed against the Holy Spirit by some wayward thought or some careless comment. Maybe you've wondered the same thing, or maybe you're watching right now in fear at this moment, thinking you've committed the unpardonable sin. Let me help you understand what Jesus was talking about in Mark 3. Who he was talking to was the religious leaders, men who knew the Word of God through and through, men who should have easily seen that Jesus wasn't just some ordinary guy, but that he fulfilled all the prophecies in the Old Testament, all the things that were written about the coming Messiah, the Redeemer, the Savior of the world. Even though God, through the Holy Spirit, revealed the truth of Jesus to these men, still they rejected the Holy Spirit's work at clearly identifying who Jesus Jesus was and instead they repeated and they would continue to repeat and believe that Jesus wasn't the Messiah. Saying he was possessed by a demon was blasphemy against the Holy Spirit and the continued rejection of Jesus was the unpardonable sin. Today, the only way someone could commit the unforgivable sin is to reject Jesus and die in their sin. Because forgiveness of sin is only found in Jesus. If you reject him in this life, you can't find forgiveness in the next. Listen, you don't have to worry if you've committed the unforgivable sin in the past. Instead, make sure you've taken the opportunity to go to Jesus in repentance, through faith, to receive eternal hope and the forgiveness of any and all sins. And that's today's Bible Munch. In July of 1054, after an unfortunate fight between the Patriarch of Constantinople and a delegate of the Pope, the leaders of the Eastern and Western churches mutually excommunicated one another. For many, this event marks the definitive cause of the Great Schism, the moment when the two churches permanently fell out of communion with one another. But is it really that simple? While undoubtedly the most dramatic event of the relationship, history reveals that it was neither the beginning nor the end of the story of schism between East and West. Even though the Eastern and Western churches did not declare an official state of schism until 1054, disharmony and conflict had been present for centuries, stemming from a wide variety of issues. The earliest and most obvious cause of conflict came down to culture. Essentially split between two nations, the churches had different social structures, were influenced by different philosophies, and most importantly, they spoke different languages. Imagine trying to determine precise and orthodox teachings about how God can be one yet three, eternal yet died on the cross, and then imagine trying to do that in another language. Besides the fact that this added difficulty led to less enthusiasm to work together, and the fact that great distance and danger of travel at times made it impossible to meet on a regular basis, there were numerous cases in which mistranslation caused major tension between the two. Take the issue of icons, discussed at the Second Council of Nicaea in 787. Officially promulgated in Greek, the council declared that venerating icons was permitted and not considered idolatry because the image was a vehicle for worship, not the object of worship itself. Unfortunately, when this was taken back to the West and translated for Charlemagne's court, the word venerate was translated as adore, an obvious heresy. In turn, Charlemagne called a local council in Frankfurt in 794 to condemn the teachings of Nicaea angering the East. Beyond strictly cultural issues, there were also issues of theology that caused a strife between the churches. One such issue was the role of clerical celibacy. Although its strict enforcement wasn't universalized in the West until centuries later, there has always been an emphasis placed on it, something that the East never imposed and did not agree with. There were also differences when it came to defining and emphasizing the nature of the Trinity, the use of leavened or unleavened bread in worship, and varied rules when it came to fasting. But no matter how much culture, language, and theology created unrest, they were not enough to cause a schism on their own. No, what eventually pushed them over the edge is something that gets to us all politics. Originally, the church had five major centers of religious authority where the most important bishops resided. Rome, Constantinople, Alexandria, Antioch, and Jerusalem. While a stretch to say that they worked together as a democracy, there is definitely a sense that, at least in the beginning, there was a mutual respect and dependence on one another for leadership. 
Over the course of the first millennia, the political landscape of the Christian world changed tremendously, witnessing the fall of Rome, the rise of Islam, weakened nations, and constant war. As this political unrest continued, Rome became increasingly isolated from the other seas. While the remaining four still worked as collegial members of an authoritative body, the Bishop of Rome began to work more independently, and as he gained more civil power, began to see himself as the sole shepherd of not only the Western Church, but of all of Christendom. As a result, issues like the Filioque controversy began to arise. In the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed of 381, the line regarding the Holy Spirit reads, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father. If this seems incomplete to Catholics today, that's because the words and the Son, or Filioque in Latin, were added in the sixth century to combat heretics and to clarify the West's interpretation. And while it might seem like a strictly theological issue without practical importance, don't be fooled. At its core, this was an issue of political and ecclesial authority. The East, coming from a collegial and apostolic perspective, could not accept the Pope's authority over an ecumenical council. The West, coming from a more hierarchical and Christological perspective, saw it as the rightful place of the Pope to make such decisions. Two centuries later, another controversy arose over this question of jurisdiction. In 858, Emperor Michael III deposed the Patriarch of Constantinople and replaced him with a more favorable leader. Pope Nicholas, believing himself to be the shepherd of the whole flock, investigated the events, summoned a council, and concluded that this was an inappropriate decision. Going over the emperor's authority, he deposed the new patriarch and reinstated the old one. But wait, it gets worse. When Nicholas was questioned by Michael, he essentially responded that kings need popes, but popes don't need kings. Ooh, buddy. Yeah, Nicholas was excommunicated by the East for that. But the church remained together. Even in 1009, when Pope Sergius IV sent a letter to the East that included the Filioque, and the East in turn removed the Pope from the official list of prayers, schism had not yet been reached. And yet, at the same time, the Church remained largely divided, officially in communion, but unofficially fractured for centuries. Placed within the context of the wider contentious story, the events of 1054 might still jump out as dramatic and damaging to the relationship, but it's unfair to say that it would have been understood in its time as a permanent split. Because really, everything that's been mentioned up to this point is operating on a very high level. Political authority, esoteric theological formulas, translations of official documents. The working man or woman did not give one iota about these matters. That was until 1098 and the First Crusade. You know how you try to do something nice to fix a problem but end up doing something much worse? Yeah, that's sort of what happened. Extending an olive branch that had previously been withheld, Pope Urban sent troops to Constantinople to aid the East in defending its city. Unfortunately, instead of fighting for the East, the Western soldiers began fighting against the East for part of the reconquered lands, acted rude and greedy, and eventually drove the Greek patriarch into exile so they could install their own Latin one. Oops. For the first time, the conflict between East and West had been brought to the level of the people, and they wanted nothing of it. Language, culture, theology, and politics aside, they just hated each other on a gut level. More than any excommunication or power grab by a pope, what cemented division between the two churches was the unfortunate actions of greedy soldiers coming from the West, but not representing it well. Luckily, things have changed since then. In 1964, Pope Paul VI embraced Patriarch Athenagoras I on the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem, a symbolic gesture of peace that established a tradition honored by their successors. The following year, the North American Orthodox Catholic Theological Consultation began meeting and has been meeting semi-annually since. In 2003, they even reached the conclusion and recommended to their prospective bishops that the filioque was no longer a church-dividing issue. And most recently, being that he's a very collegially-minded pope, Pope Francis has made tremendous strides towards reunification, explicitly stating in 2014 that he's seeking communion with the Orthodox churches. And maybe that's where we're headed. The point, I think, to remember in all of this is that division did not happen overnight. Rather than just being over one moment of passion that resulted in mutual excommunications, the division between East and West developed over a long period of time and on a wide variety of issues. Unification, if that's what we seek, is going to take a lot of time to develop as well. But if we truly believe that we are the body of Christ and we can agree on so much of what makes us Christian, that's one task we should be ready to take on. Thank okay, so I hope that sets the background uh, for our discussion on the Holy Spirit. Lah, okay, they say we believe the Holy Spirit is much more than just one line. Huh? There's much more to it.